Let us pray. Father God, we come before you with nothing. Father, break us today. Take away our pride, our arrogance. And Father, today, give us a glimpse of your throne room so that we can understand how big and great you are, how merciful and loving and gracious you are. That, Father, we may shrink in our seats today. That even if we have to hide beneath the pews, because today we have come to worship you today. And so, Father, hide me behind the cross. That everything that is said and done, let it be for the honor and glory of your name. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We've been studying about not a fan, not a fan, not a fan. And today's title is Not a Fan, Then I Need You to Worship. Worship. And I have to be honest, and I have to apologize to uh, Miamians. I've been kind of hard on, you, on your sports and beating you guys up. But if you notice, fans will do crazy things. Fans will, will dress a certain way, and they will act a certain way when they go to the stadium. And this, of course, is the University of Miami. And you have the fans there of the Miami Dolphins. Next slide. But this is my favorite. This is my favorite picture. Here's my favorite picture. Here's my favorite picture. Here's my favorite picture. <laughs> what is a fan? What is a fan? A fan is nothing more and nothing less than an enthusiastic admirer. Enthusiastic admirer. And God is not calling us to be an enthusiastic admirer. God is calling us to be what? Not to be a Miami Heat fan. No, 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 no. <laughs> God is calling us to be a follower. God is calling us to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And so, of course, I had this Miami Heat fan because, you know, I've been beating up you guys. Uh, one, one thing that I love about you guys is win or lose, you're a Miami Heat fan for life. Amen? Amen? And that's kind of the same thing with Christianity. It's the same thing with us being disciples. We are called to be disciples of Jesus, not just 7-Eleven. Hello, someone. We come to church just on Sabbath, and we come to church just at 11 o'clock. God is calling for us to be disciples and for us to be disciple makers. And so today what we're going to do, we're starting our week of evangelism, spring evangelism, where each day we're going to look at something that happened in the life of Jesus Christ. And on Saturday, the Bible tells us in John chapter 12, six days before the Passover, six days before he gave his life and became the Passover lamb, six days before Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead, and here a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Six days. I want you to picture that because if you knew that you were going to die in six days, I'm talking to you right now. If you knew that you were going to die in six days, what would you do? Probably cry, depressed, or you would spend time with loved ones. You would spend time with family. And when he came with, to Jesus, he loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And he was spending time with them. And so the Bible tells us, not only was he in their house, Matthew 26 gives us more details. It says, while Jesus was in Bethany, in the home of Simon the leper, and in Luke, it tells us that when one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. So now, custom, tradition says that Simon the leper was one that Jesus healed. But tradition says, and I don't have no Bible text, I don't have no spirit of prophecy, but tradition says that Simon the leper was the husband of Martha. And so it makes sense that Martha would be serving in the house, and Mary is going to be present in Lazarus. And so this was a Sabbath potluck. They went to church, and they went to eat. And the Bible says that while they were probably um, 
finished eating and they were talking and fellowshipping, the dinner party was interrupted. The Bible says that a woman in Luke, in Luke chapter 7, verse 37, Luke chapter 7, verse 37 says that a woman in that town who lived a sinful life, who lived a sinful life, came to Jesus, poured ointment on his head, and poured it on his feet, and dried his, hair, his feet with his hair, and washed his feet with her tears. The Bible says that a sinful woman came into that house, came into Simon the leper's house, came into the Pharisee's house. John tells us who that woman was. Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet, wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. Now, I went on the internet, and I said, okay, what are the, the most expensive perfumes that are out there? And there's 10. So I picked, a, I picked two. I was surprised at this one. This is Chanel number five. Chanel number five. Anyone want to guess how much this costs per ounce? 125? 225? Well, this is not the one, this is not the Chanel number five that you get at Target or, or Macy's. No, 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 no. This is the one that comes, is made from rose and jasmine from Chanel's very own field in France. The cost for this one is 4,200 per ounce. 4,200 per ounce. That's right, that's what I said. Chanel number five, really? But the number one perfume, it's on the Guinness Book of Records. It's called, if you guys in the back can help me, having problems here, just slide for me. It's this one. It's called Clive Christian Number One Imperial Majesty Perfume. Anyone want to guess how much is this one per ounce? Go back, go back, guys, go back. No, 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 go Go forward. There you go. $12,721.89 per ounce. If you want to buy the whole bottle, it's going to cost you $215,000. How's that for a wedding gift? <laughs> no? Okay, so what's going on now? Man, the devil always messes, messes with us, man. The devil always messes. Father God, the devil's angry. But Father, we rebuke him in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. And so I pray, Father, that you may intervene in what's happening with our systems. And, and I pray, Father, that sermon may go forward. So I'll pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right now. The Bible says that Mary, she came and she poured perfume on the feet of Jesus. The Bible tells us that when she poured that perfume, it filled the whole house. Can you just go to the next slide? Next slide. See, the ordinary dinner party became a worship service. And let me just remind the church for a minute that this was not a church service. This was not a church building. This was a, a living room. This was a house, and there was nothing special going on. It was a dinner party. But this woman came with a heart full of worship because she understood, she understood when she came in the presence of Jesus how sinful she was. See, if you remember, John chap this is John chapter 12, but if you remember John chapter 11, John chapter 11 was when Lazarus, her brother, had died. And she came up to Jesus and she said to Jesus, if you were here, my brother would have not died. And so she accused Jesus, it's your fault that my brother is dead. And instead of Jesus, you know, he just reminded her, hey, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, what? Shall not perish, but what? And so she, Jesus, resurrected her brother. And so here is Jesus now in, in, in the house of Simon the leper, and she recognizes, man, he 
brought my dead brother back to life. So she came with a heart of gratitude, but she also came in the presence of Jesus with a heart of repentance. She came with a heart of repentance because she understood, I sinned against Jesus. See, it's very easy to look at Simon the leper, and this is the problem with Simon the leper. Simon the leper was cured from leprosy, but he was a Pharisee. And so it's very easy for, La- for Simon to look at Mary and later on tell, G- in his mind, say, if Jesus knew who this woman was, he would not allow this woman to touch him. Don't we do the same thing? Because, see, in our minds, we, we have categories for sin. We think that, that the, 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 the sins of the world are worse than our little pet sins. But last week, let me remind you, the Bible says in Revelation that the cowards are going to be thrown into the lake of fire, that the liars are going to be thrown into the lake of fire, that the thieves are going to be thrown into the lake of fire. Any thieves in the house? Any liars in the house? Any cowards in the house? And so we have to understand that when we come to the presence of Jesus, we all need him to save us. And so we need to come with a spirit of worship. And so Mary, Mary came. Mary came with her perfume. Next slide. And see, what we have to understand is what is praise and what is worship. And let me just say this right here, right now. What we do here on Sabbath is not worship. What we do here on Sabbath when we're singing is praise. Let's, let's talk about this. Praise. It comes from, no, back it up, back it up, back it up. Back it up. Praise comes from the Hebrew. The Hebrew word is, 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 is yada. And yada means to confess. So when we come to this house, while, while we have the people's prayers, it's not for your mind to go in outer space. It's for you to, in the, in the presence of God, at that time, for you to confess your sins before God. See, we have become uh, entertainment-driven. And so we just be, we be, we become passive worshipers. And so we just want to listen. But to praise means to confess, to give thanks. In the Greek, the word is anil. Anil means, hello someone, to celebrate. Now, I know you Miami Heat fans and Dolphin fans, you know how to celebrate. Especially the last time you guys won. I'm just saying. When the Miami Heat won and you were in your house, were you, were, you, were you in your house like, oh, that was nice. That was great. That was beautiful. How did you celebrate? Ah, I can't believe it. We did it. Will you bang pots? Pots. So why is it that when we come to church, we, we, we can't celebrate? When we come to church, We can't praise. See, because in our minds, this is what has happened. Here's how the devil has 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 conned us. Well, we're not Pentecostal, Pastor. Where we're not charismatic, Pastor. Come on, church. The Bible says, next next verse, next next verse, that everything that has breath, what? If you have breath, it's time when you come to church, is to celebrate is to give praise, is to give thanks, is to confess. Next slide. But here's the problem. Psalms 109 verse 30 says, I will greatly praise the Lord with my mouth. Yes, I will praise him among the multitudes. Whether you're up here leading worship or whether you're sitting there, you are praising him. You are celebrating his presence in your life. What are the things that I hate? I hate this stage. That's why I don't like preaching from here. This stage does something to us. This stage messes with us. It hurts us. It messes with our ego. I will greatly praise the Lord with my mouth. Yes, I will praise him among the multitudes. Next slide. Now, what is worship? Worship in the Hebrew is shaka. Shaka means what? To prostrate, 
to bow, to surrender. That's in the Greek, in the Hebrew. But in the Greek, the word means, the word is latrio. Latrio means to minister before God. That's why I say what we do here on Sabbath is not worship. We're praising. Worship is when you surrender your life to God and you're ministering to Him. And so that happens not on Saturday in a church setting. It happens outside in your everyday life when you're worshiping Him. You're ministering to Him. You're surrendering your life to Him. But we think, and that's where Brandon was right, the most important part of the service, the only time you can say that you're actually worshiping is when you're returning your tithes and offering. Because now you're surrendering. You're surrendering your pocketbook. Bible says, next slide, next slide, next slide. Ellen White says, review and herald. Listen to what she says. True worship consists in working together with Christ. Prayers, exhortation, and talk are cheap, which are frequently tied on, but fruits that are manifested in what? Good works, caring for the needy, the fatherless, the widows, are genuine fruits and grow naturally upon a good tree. How we're worshiping now. A lot of us, oh, that, that, that worship was good today, Pastor. No, we didn't worship today. Worship is when you go to Miami uh, rescue mission. Worship is that, that, that guy who's sitting outside, who we see him every Sabbath, and he's asking for money. It's for you to say after church, hey, I'm going to take you to a restaurant to eat. That's worship. See, it's very easy to come here to sing. Next slide. The Bible says, so why do we worship God? Why do we worship God? Two reasons. Worship God. The first one. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 4, 11, here's the first reason. Worthy are you, O Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Why do we worship God? Why do we worship God? Because he's our creator. That's why a Seventh-day Adventist, we worship on the Sabbath. Next slide. The Bible says six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that's in them, and he rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath and hallowed it. We come to church on Sabbath not to remember the cross. We come on Sabbath to remember that he is creator and he's recreator of my life. We remember him as creator. The next slide says the second reason why we worship. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. The second reason why we celebrate and we worship. Next slide. To recognize that he's what? Our redeemer, our savior. Next slide. But here's the question. How you view God is fundamental for the kind of life you live. Your picture of God will determine how you worship him. Next slide. If your God is a small God, you're going to be ungrateful. You're going to be ungrateful. Simon the leper should have been grateful to God. I was healed, and now he's in my house, and, and, and I should be celebrating. But his view of God was small, and he becomes ungrateful. Next slide. little commercial here. You have an iPhone, Mac, Xbox, PS3, internet, pocket money, more than most families budget. You're not happy. He uses a rock as a camera. He's the happiest kid in the world. Just a thought. Keep going. How do you view God, your picture of God? If your picture of God is small, you are going to take God out of his throne, out of his judgment throne, and you are going to sit on that throne, and you will say things like this. If God is a God of love, why do people suffer? If God is a God of love, why do bad things happen to good people? If God is a God of love, why am I going through this tribulation? When your picture of God is small, you will place yourself as God and you will start judging God. Mary had a bigger picture of God. Next slide. She understood that this God sits on the throne. She understood that Jesus is creator, but he's also savior. She understood that, uh oh, one day I have to stand before God. 
And God is going to ask me, wait a minute, if you love me so much, why didn't you feed the hungry? Why didn't you give to the poor? Why didn't you do something for the needy? Oh, we don't like that one, huh? Mary had a picture of God that was worthy of her worship. Next slide. And so what did she do? She took that perfume, which by the way, it wasn't really perfume. It was an ointment, a very expensive ointment that was used for burial, for embalmment. That probably was for her burial. Follow me now. The Bible says that she broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. She's like, and by the way, how much did it cost? It cost 300 denaries. 300 denaries was a year's worth of salary. 53,000, 60,000, let's put it in, in today. And she did not say, bueno, esto está muy caro. This is too expensive. So I'm just going to put a drop on his head. The Bible says that she broke the bottle and poured the whole thing on his head. Next slide. See, when you worship, you're pouring out your life, your life to Jesus. You're surrendering your life to Jesus. Next slide. See, she had a posture of worship. What's your posture of worship? Next slide. Let me ask you a question. Mary gave the most precious possession she had to Jesus. Every Sabbath when you come here, what's the most precious possession that you bring to Jesus? Hopefully is yourself. Amen? Next slide. But see, here's the question. What do we do to show our love and faith to Jesus? Next slide. If you were ever accused of being Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? See, coming to church is not, not it. Many people go to church. Many people. But what is going to convict you is your life of worship. That's what's going to tell people that you are a disciple. The, the next slide, next slide says, here's what John MacArthur says. John MacArthur says this, and I'm going to read it slowly. The crucial factor in worship in the church is not the form of worship. Why is it that we have worship wars in our church? The crucial factor in worship in the church is not the form of worship, but the state of the hearts of the saints. If our corporate worship is not the expression of our individual worshiping lives, it is unacceptable. What's happening here is an extension of what you're doing during the week. If you're not worshiping during the week, you're not going to worship here. You're not going to praise here. And, and, and see, this is what happens. If you think you can live any way you want and then go to church and turn on the worship with the saints, you're wrong. Next slide. And so here's, here's Mary. She had a passion of worship. When she worshiped, even though she did it secretly, the Bible says, next slide, that the whole house was filled with the odor of the anointment. Did you catch that? What she did in private affected everyone that was there. Listen to me carefully. Your worship is going to invoke a reaction from those around you. Let's see. Next slide. The Bible says, not the Bible, Philip Keller says this. The delicious fragrance ran down over his shining hair. It unfolded his body with its delightful aroma. Even his tunic and flowing undergarment were drenched with its enduring pungency. Wherever he moved during the enduring days, the perfume would go with him into the Passover, into the Garden of Gethsemane, into Herod's Hall, into Pilate's patio, even with the cruel hands of those who cast lots for his clothing. With each crack of the whip, Mary's gift was remembered. With each nail driven, her love was felt. Did you know that your nose can detect over 10,000 odors? There was a time, there's a perfume that... Uh, a girlfriend of mine would wear, I mean my wife would wear. 
Let's fix this. <laughs> and I, it, when I tell you the story, you're going to see why. <laughs> and so one time I'm in a mall. I'm in a mall. And I smell the perfume. And I quickly remember, oh, that's Linda. <laughs> as, as I'm smelling, and, and, and all of a sudden I'm remembering the times, the dress, the hair when she had the perfume, right? And I'm in, I'm in, I'm in the shop, and then when I find out, oh, it was an 80-year-old lady who had the perfume. And <laughs> but the point I'm trying to make before I, don't, before I get in trouble is that your smell will bring back memories to your worship. Here is what Mary did on Sabbath afternoon when Jesus rode on the donkey on Sunday and they celebrated him as a king. He smelled her worship. When he went on Monday to the temple to clean the temple, he smelled Mary's worship. When he went to the, the Tuesday and he, he cursed the fig tree, he remembered Mary's worship. When he was in Wednesday in the Mount of Olives and he's talking about the signs of the coming, he remembered Mary's worship. But on Thursday, when Judas betrayed him and Peter denied him, and when they arrested him that night, and they took him into the different trials that Thursday, Friday night, and they were beating him. He smelled the perfume. When they took him to the cross, and probably he, they stripped him naked, and as he's hanging there naked, maybe there was a breeze, a gentle breeze that came, and he smelled the perfume. He remembered the gift of worship that Mary had given him. Can God say the same for us today with our worship? Next slide. Your worship is going to invoke a reaction. And right there, by the way, Mary did not care what she looked like. Mary was on her feet, on her knees, as she was using her hair. That was a very provocative and uncomfortable situation to be in. Someone would have said, I'm not going to do that because I'm going to look the fool. But Mary understood how much she was forgiven. Mary came with a heart of gratitude that she did not care what people thought. When is that going to happen in our church? That if you feel like getting up and you want to raise your hands, you can. Without the fear of someone looking at you. Your worship is going to invoke a reaction. The Bible says some of those present, backslide, back, back, back. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, why this waste of perfume? Huh? Why the bass is too strong, the drum is too strong, the, the, we're not singing hymns anymore. Why is it that that person is singing the way he's singing? Why? And we go on, and we go on, and we go on. Judas said, it could have been sold for more than a year's wages, and the money given to the poor, and they rebuked him harshly. Next slide. But one of the disciples said, why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? Judas was not, he did not care about the poor. Judas was only interested in whom? Himself. But I want you to follow what I'm saying. Worship is going to invoke a reaction from those around you. And so you're either going to be worshiping God or you're going to have a critical spirit. Next slide. Just a thought. While some are worshiping, others will find a way to discourage them. Let me say something about praise team. When I was at PUC... I noticed something that they would, they would turn off the lights. And the praise team would be in the front, and they would have the lights to them. And, and, and everything was dark. And, and one time I asked the question, I said, you know what? Because see, I'm coming from the East Coast. I'm coming from my mind, my mind from the East Coast. And you know what I said? The lights are off. It kind of looks like a club. <laughs> How did I know it looked like a club? Anyway. And so I mentioned it to the young people. I said, why is it that the lights are turned off? This is what they said I'll never forget. 
Pastor, we turn off the lights because as a praise team, we don't want to see the congregation. Because the way the congregation reacts influences our worship. And I can tell you it's the truth. I'll tell you right now, I miss preaching in an African-American church. Come on, pastor. Preach it, pastor. Help him, Jesus. <laughs> and so the congregation is, is kind of feeding me. And the same thing happens when we worship. And the praise team looks out into the audience. And if they see you like this, and if they see you quiet, because we can see you. I see some of you sleeping, and that's why I went, well, no one's sleeping. I said, and Jesus said, because I can see you sleeping. <laughs> Nobody's sleeping in. And so this is what they told me. We don't want the congregation to affect our worship. And then a student said, now on the flip side, the student said to me, Pastor, we want it dark. Because, and this is Carlo, his, his Carlo, I'll never forget, Haitian, by the way. Carlo said to me, when I worship, I'm charismatic in my worship. And so if it's a happy song, I am jumping. And he will come to the front and he's jumping. If it's a sad song, he's crying. And he said, Pastor, I don't want anyone to see me. Because what I'm doing right now is for God to see and so I just said a lot to my praise team, and I said a lot to the congregation. Worship is a personal experience with God. You don't know the song? I learned this a long time ago. Try to learn the song. There's a reason why some of the songs repeat, so that you can catch on. If you're still not feeling the song, open your Bible and read something. Don't let anyone steal your blessing. Mary could care less that they were accusing her and they were talking about her. She said, I am worshiping my Jesus, my King, my Savior. I don't know what's going on, but I see something different about him. Ellen White says that she did not know what was coming, but she kind of saw it in his face. And it was sad that the disciples who were with him for three and a half years could not pick up what Mary picked up. Mary picked up, uh-oh, he needs to be worshipped today. He, he needs a little love today. Next slide, next slide. The Bible says, as I close, that Jesus said, leave her alone. Leave her alone. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. And they still did not get it. Because if you read the rest of the story, let me tell you what was going on in that table. The Pharisees were sitting on that table planning to kill Lazarus. Now, I find that funny. Jesus had just resurrected Lazarus, and they were planning to kill Lazarus and to kill Jesus. How can you kill the guy who was raised from the dead? And how can you kill the guy who raised the dead guy to life? But you see what happens when you're not worshiping? You see what happens when you are in the presence of members and, and sisters, brothers and sisters of Christ, but your mind is not in Christ. You're distracted, and the devil feeds you. And you think that you're here listening to a sermon, because by the way, the disciples were listening. Mary, Mar I mean, Martha was serving. The only one who was worshiping there was Mary. Next slide. And so it says, Desire of Ages says that he knew that in this act of service, she had expressed her gratitude for the forgiveness of her sins. As you leave here today, what can God say about your worship to him today? Can he really say, wow, Lafitte, I really, I, I really felt your, your gratitude today. I really felt it. Thank you. I love you. Or is he going to say, oh, well, I'll see you next week, Lafitte. I love you. I miss you. Next slide. J 
Judas. In commending Mary's action, Christ had rebuked Judas. Can I pause here for a minute? I love Jesus. Jesus is a better man than most of us. I would have told Judas, shut your mouth. You don't care about the poor. You've been stealing from me. Why don't you tell the truth, Judas? But Jesus kept it what? Quiet. And he told a story. And the story he told was, hey, Simon, uh, if, if someone owes money and it's been forgiven, who is the, the one who's going to love the most? Oh, the, mo- the one who owed the most. And so here's Mary. She's the one that has the greatest debt, and she has been forgiven. And instead of Judas getting, taking that hint, what did he do? On the Sabbath, hello, someone. On the Sabbath, he determined to be revenged. That's dangerous That's dangerous right there when you want to be revenged, when you want to be heard, when you want your way. That's dangerous. He revenged, and from the supper, he went directly where? To the the palace of the high priest and offered to betray Jesus into their hands. On the Sabbath, after potluck, Judas, one of the elders of the church, went to betray Jesus. Next slide. But here's what Jesus says. Truly I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Isn't that powerful? Isn't that beautiful? That, what, that, that act of worship, next slide, that act of worship, that act of worship, I want you to remember that God will memorialize the worship of any believer who sacrifices for him. If you sacrifice for him, he's not going to forget you. And it's sad how the world has taken Mary's innocent expression of worship and has, has tainted it into something that is ugly, where they say that Mary was the wife of Jesus where they say that Mary and, and, and Jesus, that, that they faked the death and that they ran away to France and they had children and that the Catholic Church preserved that secret because, you know, what, what's going to happen if the world knows, finds out that Jesus... That is an invention of hell itself because the devil does not want us to express worship the way Mary expressed worship. Next slide. So today, you could be sitting here listening to a sermon, or, next slide, you could be serving in a ministry. And like I said last week, Sabbaths here are too full. Thank God today is the fourth Sabbath. It's family Sabbath. Go home. Enjoy your families. No meetings today. Amen, amen. You're probably coming here to serve. Or maybe, next slide, maybe you're here to fellowship. You have some friends. You're hanging out, and you have good community. Next slide. Or maybe you come on Sabbath, and you have a critical spirit. You find something at fault. Oh, there goes the pastor again. He's messing with the Miami Heat. Leave it alone, pastor. Or maybe the worship team, the way they sang a song. Or maybe the drum was played a little lost. Uh, or we're not playing the organ enough. And you allow the devil to plant a seed of unworship in your heart. Or you can be, next slide, Mary. And you recognize that this week I messed up. This morning, I messed up. And I come to this house, and I, was, I want to surrender my life to Jesus. Because he is my savior, and he's my creator. And he's also my re-creator. And so that was Sabbath afternoon. Six days before Jesus went to the cross, Not his disciples, not Lazarus, not Peter, James, or John. Mary, the sinful woman, came into the presence of Jesus and offered worship. What will this church look like 
if every Sabbath we come with the spirit of Mary to worship Jesus.
Father God, first and foremost, I ask for forgiveness. There have been times when I know that I needed to be more expressive in my worship to you. There have been times when I needed to just raise my hands and just don't care what people think or say. But Father, I've been fearful of what people may say. Father, give us the heart that Mary had. She did not care. She was a woman that was forgiven. And she poured everything to you. Father, as I look at my own life, what's the most expensive thing that I've given to you? What sacrifice have I made? Tithe is not a sacrifice. It's 10%. I give that to you. I return it. Offering, that's not enough. Father, help us to have a spirit of sacrifice. Father, we, 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 we say, well, church is too far, or it's too cold, or it's too hot, I'm too tired. But Father, give us a spirit of sacrifice. Mary understood that Jesus was about to offer his life to you. She may not have understood it all completely, but she knew that something was coming. And Father, we know, we know, and we keep playing church. Father, this week as the world remembers Easter, I pray, Father, that the prayer request of one of the members that came here every night, I said he's crazy, but I'm going to say what he said. He said, Pastor, I want this church to be filled like it's filled on Saturday every night. That the members will come and bring someone. That they, they are praying and fasting for the Lord to make a way to bring someone because, Father, you're coming back and you want to take us home so that we can worship you in spirit and in truth but father break us break us like mary was broken so father some of us are going to leave here like judas critical some of us are going to leave like simon the leper some of us are going to be indifferent and clueless like the disciples but i pray that some of us may leave to go home and find that alabaster for them to pour it to your head and feet, not just today, but every day. Thank you, Father, for this time, and we love you. We can't wait to see you again. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Happy Sabbath. <laughs>